today. Praise the Lord for that. We uh, I do want to remind you that the uh, funeral for Daryl Stepp, one of our own, is uh, on uh, Wednesday. The viewing will be between 3 and 5 down on Ford Road at uh, L. J. Griffin. Um, there on Ford Road. It'll be from 3 to 5 is the visitation. The service is there at 5 o'clock. And then after that, there'll be a luncheon here at the church. So all of you who want to participate in that will uh, be welcome. And we won't have the Bible studies here. That we'll have that funeral. Then we'll come here for the luncheon. And uh, I just want to remind you of that, let you know that that is taking place this week. We've been studying in the book of Philippians, a series I've entitled Joy in Philippians. This will be the last message in that series. <clears throat> so today we've come to a point that I've called Joy in Contentment. Joy in Contentment. Now Bernard Williams wrote, We may pass violets looking for roses, we may pass contentment looking for victory. There are many times in our lives we pass up things of great beauty and great opportunity looking for something else. God's Word teaches us that real victory, real peace, real joy, all of those things are achieved as we learn to be content in Christ and content with the path that He has ordained for each of us. And that path is not the same for each of us. His calling to salvation, His calling for us to be witnesses, and His calling to praise His name and to serve Him, to become like Him, those are all the same. But the path that we walk and the places that we serve, the ways that we do that, the gifts that He has given us, they're all unique. And we have to be able to understand and hear from the Lord and understand what He wants us to do if we're going to live this life of contentment. Today, we often miss, I think, the doorway to victory, the doorway to peace and joy that is contentment, because we're looking, you know, we don't see contentment as the doorway to victory or the doorway to joy. You know, in fact, I think we, we have sometimes pictured in our own mind what the way to victory, the way to joy, the way to peace, the way to all of these things looks like. And because we have this image in our mind, we can't see the doorway that God actually has put before us. I'm sure you've all done it. I, you know, I've done it many times. In my mind, I see something and I'm looking through all of the stuff to find it, but I've envisioned something orange and it's in a black container. You know, and you look and you look and you look, you just can't see it because you put yourself a mental block because the only thing you can see is what you have imagined. You see, in faith, there is contentment. And in contentment, there is peace. And in contented faith, there is power. That's Scripture. Power to do all things. Have you found yourself lacking contentment and power? Have you lost some peace that you may have once known with God? Those are real questions. We're humans. We get off track very easily. In Philippians 4 and verse 11, it begins, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. 
everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Father, as we come before you today, we pray that you would, Lord, show each of us those places in our lives where we are hindered from knowing real contentment, the peace of God, the joy of the Lord in our lives, whatever that is. For those who have come and have never yet truly accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that today they would understand their need and be able to make that decision. For those who are believers, Lord, I pray that you would show us those barriers in our minds, those things that we have blinded ourselves with or those things that the world system has, has blinded us so that we cannot see the greatest guidance, the way to peace and joy through contentment in Jesus Christ. Show us your way, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin this, perspective again, that's where I started this entire thing in Philippians, was on perspective. But if we can come to understand that it's all about Christ and not about us, it's not about what we have, it will help us seek the things that will bring us victory, peace, joy, all of those things. And when you understand that, this little saying makes sense. Contentment is a realization that life is a gift, not a right. You and I only live by the grace of God. He could have wiped us out. He could have failed to tend to us. He could have taken away our breath. Anything you can imagine could have happened, and yet God, through all the ages, has kept it possible for you and I to be here today. For you and I to have the freedoms and the the blessings that we enjoy in life. It all hinges on Him. Place we begin. Finding contentment, though, Finding contentment, that can be difficult. The Apostle Paul begins in verse 10 talking about, he says, you churches at Philippi, I want you to understand your help was of immeasurable encouragement and benefit to me. And your help, because you helped with no thought of anything in return, you will receive blessings both now and in heaven for what you have done to support me, to support the ministry, and all of those things that go with it. And so what, what is contentment? We need to understand that. One of the greatest things about contentment that you have to get a hold of is contentment is not about abundance. Contentment is not about having everything. Contentment is a learned skill, if you will. It's not a natural reaction. We're humans. It takes faith to know real contentment. Because, you know, we get all wrapped up in the wrong things sometimes. The Apostle Paul, I just read, he says, I have experience with this. He said, I know abasement. I know what it means to be humbled, brought low. Remember who he was. He was on the way to the top to be probably the most respected and loved person in the entire nation. He had the education, he had the position, he had the training, he had all that would come with it. And then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus and realized that his whole life that had been dedicated to God was actually against what God wanted. And he was laid low. 
When the Apostle Paul, well, when he was Saul and he was serving in Judaism, he would come into a town and people would rally around him because he had the right to have Christians imprisoned and killed. And to the Jews, he was a hero. I'm sure he came into that situation and people were excited about him coming. Then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And when he came into town, the Jews didn't want anything to do with him, but neither did the Christians. He had a reputation. Wait a minute, that's the guy that kills us. And he went from being the most popular guy to being the guy that nobody wanted to be around. I mean, the streets probably literally cleared around him, you know? What's going on? And he had to prove himself again to people. <clears throat> but he said, I know how to abound. I know what it means to have all the increase. I know what it means to, have, uh, to excel at, at something. So I have experienced the great victories and the great excitement of having everything, not wanting for anything. And I have experienced the other end of that where I have been hated, where I have lacked for the basic necessities. And he has come to this place to teach us that contentment is about having peace with God, but also, by faith, having peace with God's plan. Now we're talking about a man who served the Lord who lost everything. He said, I count everything as dung that I achieved. Everything about my life, my education, everything. Now, God would use parts of it. We understand that. But he says, look, everything that I was trying to achieve and try to become, worthless. But when I met Jesus, my life took a turn. Instead of riding in the best carriages or whatever, he walked from town to town. He was beaten with rods and with whips. They threw stones at him, tried to kill him. Some believe that meant he actually was killed and resurrected. He went from way up here to way down there. And he said, I understand. And yet he could still say, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He said, I trust God's plan. I thought I was doing God's work. I had dedicated my entire life to God's work. Then I met Jesus and realized, <laughs> you're fighting against God's plan. Everything you're doing is wrong. And so he turned his life and said, I'm going to trust God. That's when he began to suffer all the loss. Shipwrecks and beatings and all those things that come in to play. And yet he said, I still was able to find contentment because I understand how, de you know, how deceived I was. I thought I knew what I was doing and I was so wrong. Now I understand. When I do it God's way, it may be a rough road. But I have a contentment in knowing that I will never lack anything I really need as long as I'm doing what God wants me to do the way God wants me to do it. You know, what life took more faith? A life where he was pampered and educated and taken care of, or a life where he had to walk and swim upstream? <laughs> I mean took a lot of abuse. And yet he had the faith to stand up, to get up after he'd been stoned, to walk right back into town. To kind of shake the dust off his feet when he was rejected and Jesus was rejected and move on to the next one because that's what God wanted him to do. And not give up. God instructs us to be happy whether we're full or whether we're hungry. Whether we have excess and abundance or whether we have 
basic needs for living. You know, when we talk about our needs, they're real. And when our needs are met, we do feel happy. And when they're not met, we're not very happy. We feel bad. I mean, we have physical needs like sustenance. You know, we get hungry. We need sleep. We get tired. We need warmth. We have emotional needs for approval and appreciation and affection and all of those things. We have spiritual needs of forgiveness, of love and joy and peace in our lives. Those are needs that God put within us. And we are driven by our needs. Needs affect our emotions. Emotions affect the way we think, and our thinking determines our behavior. Therefore, how we view our needs affect how we live and the decisions we make. And too often, we get things all mixed up. We decide we are so pampered, we are so blessed in this nation, Most of us have our physical needs taken care of immediately. We don't even have to worry about them. And so what we begin to do is we begin to take our wants and put them up here in this needs list. And if God doesn't give us what we want, we say, God has failed us. God's given up on me. God's forgotten me. You know, how can I be happy if I don't have this thing that I need? And it's not really a need. Abigail's Tent Ministries, we went downtown yesterday. In the wintertime, we go down once a month. We go down to Cass Park, and we go down to the homeless, and we deliver all kinds of things. We supplied hot food, and we supplied gloves, and and socks, and uh, coats, and... uh, you know, other food to take, hand warmers and foot warmers and, you know, everything that we could gather up. We had a hard time supplying it. First of all, we didn't have enough. There were so few of us that when we got down there, we were so inundated, we couldn't hardly take care of them. It came out so quickly. And we look around and we see real need. And I know some would look at them and say, you know what, it's their own fault. We can't even go there. There was a young family there, mother and two daughters. There was a little girl, I don't know how old she was, eight, nine, He was freezing. They had a place to sleep with a relative, but they made him leave the first light every day and carry everything they had with them. It's so cold. He was freezing. He had these really light like a sweatpant kind of thing, only it was really lightweight. And she's shivering. She's freezing. Heather tried to put some gloves on her. Had to warm up her hands so she could open up her hands enough to get gloves on. Put two pair of gloves on her. She was still freezing. She was freezing so bad and shaking so badly. I mean, she wet herself. She's in wet clothes, thin, wet clothes, in the 30s, freezing. And we didn't have enough. I mean, we, had, we gave her what we had, but we didn't have enough. And we whine and complain about so many things that aren't really needs. And that little girl, through no fault of her own, had some basic needs. We 
were able to get, you know, some clothes on her. Handed out shirts and all kinds of things. But here she is, a little girl. We don't have hardly anything for little girls. And we have so much. And we still get mad at God because God didn't give us everything we want exactly the way we wanted it. And that's the American way today. Get upset because we have to wait five minutes for food in a drive through One of our families got hit this week because they wouldn't turn right on red. You know? And so, as soon as the light turned and they got a little clearance, they started to pull forward and turn right and... Somebody jumped into the berm and ran right into the side of their car in a hurry and got out and saying, you know, acting like it was their fault. Oh, you know. Road rage, upset with everybody, jealous of what other people have. And then we get mad at God because. We don't have that, God, and we need it because they have it. I need it. It's not a need. Well, I want a better job. Maybe God has you in that job because He needs you there. Maybe you need to learn something, but probably there is somebody there working with you, around you, that's going to come through there that needs to see somebody that knows the contentment of the Lord and the joy of the Lord in their life and has hope in the same situation they're in and can see that it is worth it to know Jesus Christ. We get all frustrated because our needs, our wants aren't met exactly like we want. I mean, people were throwing things at, at waiters and waitresses because it was something wrong with it. It's crazy. We need to learn God's way is the right way. We need to learn that many of the things that frustrate us, they don't really matter when it comes to the things of eternity. And we lose our testimony over some ridiculous little thing. Paul said, I've gone through things. When was the last time you were beaten within an inch of your life? When's the last time the whole town turned against you and stoned you and thought you were dead and threw you out on a rock pile? How many times have you been shipwrecked and spent a night and a day in the sea? And here's a man that understands what hard times are and he understands what the great times are and he comes to realize it's all about whether I trust God with my life. The Apostle Paul said, as long as I am doing what God has called me to do, the way God called me to do it, I am not going to worry about it. I am not going to get all frustrated with Him in my situation. I am just going to love Him and love people and let Him take care of me. You know, there's another man in the Scripture that understood what it was like to have abundance. Solomon. You ever read the works of Solomon in the Scripture? He had everything. The wisest man that ever lived. And he had it all. And at the end of his life, he comes to the understanding that everything that you can get in this world is vanity. Worthless. Empty. It can't bring joy. It can't bring contentment. And we can either be a Solomon who gets all upset and says, you know what? It's not worth it. 
Or we can be a Paul who goes through the good times and the bad and says, it doesn't matter as long as I'm right where God wants me to be. Reaching people for Him, encouraging the saints, doing whatever it takes to stay in step with the Lord. We Americans think we have to have financial security. Remember the quote, I think it was J.D. Rockefeller or someone. They asked him, he was the richest man in America at the time, they said, how much is enough? He said, one dollar more. It's never enough. There is nothing this world has to offer that will bring you the kind of peace and contentment and joy and power to be what God wants you to be. Just obedience to Jesus Christ. Your faith in Jesus Christ makes the difference. Tony Gaskin said, to be content doesn't mean you don't desire more. It means you're thankful, thankful for what you have and patient to what's to come. My wife Jackie has in the bathroom a big decorative thing. It says gratitude. It says makes what you have enough. You're struggling with what you don't have or what you want. Come to down, go downtown with us next week. Stop in at one of the shelters. Visit one of the hospital wards. Contentment. You see, a contented faith is empowering. That's what the Scripture says here. He said, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And he follows that up one verse later with, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can do all things. Regardless of the circumstances, you can keep on keeping on doing the right things with the right level of contentment because you will have the peace of God and the joy of the Lord in your life, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. We get it all twisted up. We buy into what the world's saying, we buy into what our flesh desires, and we put that above what God wants in our life, and as soon as that happens, you know what that becomes? Anything you put above God in your life becomes an idol. Just by definition. And it says that idolatry is as the sin of witchcraft. So anything you desire more in your life than a close relationship with God, you may as well be worshiping the devil because that's what witchcraft is. Does that put it in perspective? And we're all frustrated and depressed and discouraged as Christians. We're not able to go out and be the testimony that we ought to be. We're not able to put our arms around people that need us and need a hug and need encouragement and need to hear that Jesus still saves and Jesus loves them. All because we're frustrated with something. The Apostle Paul says, you know, that's not the way to power. The way to power is obedience. Being content with God's will, God's way. I believe that we as Christians are not just to endure. Now I do understand that there are times in our lives we are humans, we are weak. There are times in our lives we are fighting with everything that we have to keep on keeping on 
and we hit a barrier, and there's times where all we can do is just stand. We just don't want to slip back. We just stand. God, I can't take another step yet. But if we are faithful to say, God, show me the way and open the door. And we, we're okay, God. I know that I'm struggling right here. I know that I've got an emotional trauma going on in my head. I know that I'm struggling with happiness and all of those things. But God, you're in control and you never leave. You never forsake. You never come up short. And you supply all our need. In this passage, it says, by according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I trust you, God. And when you really, really trust God, you may be standing there, you may be just holding fast, not being able to press forward, because somebody is watching you and they need to see that your God is big enough that you don't give up on him when it gets really bad in your life. And that you're always ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. If you're in that place and you can still have the peace of God and the joy of the Lord in your life, what better testimony could there ever be? You say, I hate being here. I don't believe that Paul loved the beatings. But we look back and say, wow, that's faith. We're to be more than just enduring. We're to be victorious. We're to be overcomers. But all of the power to overcome is His. You need strength for today? Go to Jesus. You're lacking peace in your life? Go to Jesus. You need some joy in your life? Go to Jesus. Instead, we turn toward money, we turn toward wealth, we turn to whatever. You know, this is where addiction comes in. Now, the thing you need to understand about addiction is you can be addicted to anything. Yes, drugs and alcohol and things like that. But also certain pleasures. You can be addicted to making money. You can be addicted to fame. You can be addicted to just about anything. And as soon as it begins to control your life and not your obedience to the will of God, how do you expect to have peace? How do you expect God to bless the rebellious child that you are with power? It doesn't make sense. In the midst of it, we're so overwhelmed because we've taken our eyes off the Lord and we've put them on our issues. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That means I need to keep my connection to Christ in its best possible way. The Holy Spirit of Christ is the power. We just have to stay plugged in. This close, intimate relationship with Christ that we need. We need it. First of all, you have to have salvation. You cannot be connected with Christ. Now, I know the Scripture says that at one point down the road, Every knee will bow and every knee confess. But by then it's too late. We need to make our worship and our connection to Him real. And that's faith in the salvation, but also a faith in continuing discipleship. We need to keep following Him wherever He leads. Keep growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do that with corporate Bible study like we're doing now. We do that with worship and we do that with fellowship, with our classes. We do it in personal devotions and we do it in our private prayer time. But we also do it, and it, this is really important to understand, and we've all been called to it. We've all been called to serve God 
by serving others. And when you begin to look around and you see what's really going on in the lives of people around us, it's a lot easier to say, thank you God for what I have. Thank you God. We really need donations for downtown. Best thing right now is money because we'll buy exactly what they need. I can't tell you how many times things have happened that we get junk. I don't believe a Christian is ever supposed to give something they wouldn't use themselves to somebody else. I told you years ago we put together a big container full of stuff to send to Africa. Brother Bob Hayton's ministries over there. And coming through those doors, we got tattered clothing. I got used tea bags. What's wrong? We've got to be satisfied with the Lord and His work and His will and His way in our life. Charles Allen writes, Contentment gives peace and joy in our minds and hearts, which is the reward of living God's way. Kind of a paraphrase of what we just saw. God, I trust you. I'm going to do it your way. And when you do that, He'll give you a peace because you know it's the right way. You don't have to second guess yourself. And in that contentment, of saying, God, you're right. I've made so many calls in my life that were so wrong. I know I can't trust me. I'm going to trust you. And when we have that contentment, say, okay, God, whatever you want to accomplish, I'm here, I'm yours. He will then give you that power that he speaks of. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And he says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God has never let us down. God has never been late. God has never come up against an enemy or a problem that is too big for him to handle. We just have to trust him. Take our eyes off our problems and put them on Jesus. And he's going to say, look over here. Here's somebody that needs you to put your arms around them. Here's somebody that needs something you get, you know, I've given you. They need encouragement. They need the blessing of knowing Jesus as their Savior. Maybe they need a coat. You know, doesn't matter. Let's trust God with it. And he says, that contentment will bring a joy in your life that will empower Power you because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And in all of this, he says, Look, I never let you down. Just trust me. Just trust me. It'll change your life. Father, we thank you. We thank you for hearing us. We thank you for giving us your word. We thank you for the great examples in our life of men like Saul who became Paul, of Jesus who dedicated his entire life on this earth to serving others. We thank you that salvation is free, that forgiveness is permanent, that mercy is everlasting in your grace is sufficient. Lord, do whatever you need to do in our lives today. But open our eyes to the things that keep us weak, that keep us intimidated in this world, that keep us frustrated. Lord, show us what it is that we might get it out of the way. Take it out. Leave a clear sight to you. Follow you completely. 
In Jesus' precious name, amen.